every moment is full of great energy. And I don't want to go through anything fast. Not the good, not the bad, not the mundane. I want to unpack it. And that's what curiosity enables us to do. It enables us to unpack situations, learn from, experience different from, grow from. Welcome to the Spiritually Hungry Podcast with Monica and Michael Bird. It's good to be back in our studio. It feels like we haven't been here for months. We haven't. We have recorded all over the world and we've been all over the world, but it's nice to be back here in the spiritual studio. Just talking just to each other in a small little basement. (laughs) Basement. No. Oh, sorry. Our beautiful set. This is technically a basement. (laughs) Okay. Nobody needs to know that. (laughs) Really? (laughs) No, I'm joking. This isn't the basement. That's the basement. This is uh, That's a part of the basement. (laughs) <laughs> Why are you so secretive? Uh, <laughs> I'm just happy to be here with you. Me too. So um, I'm still exhausted from all the fun things we've been doing, oh, really? the work-related things we're doing, and my just, voice. My, our listeners might notice my voice is a little. You just bit, interrupted me. Full stop. I'm so sorry. As I was saying, um, you're exhausted and energized at the same time. My our children's book just yes. released. Uh, I'm going to have to interrupt you. I'm going to have to interrupt you. Oh, I can count on that. Okay. I ask all of our listeners to pause the podcast right now. <laughs> no one's going to do that. Do not. Well, actually, no, no. Wait until I finish what I want to say. Don't pause it now. Oh, can you imagine? You do that all the time. You've been no, long long You do that all the time. I'm so sorry. I apologize. Don't pause yet, but pause when I tell you. Go to Amazon.com and order as many copies as people you know of The Gift of Being Different by Monica and Abigail Berg. It is an amazing children's book. It's also good for adults. And it's about Monica. May, maybe will give us a few seconds of what it's about, um, and hopefully we'll have a few podcasts to go even more deeper into that topic. But in a second, I will ask all of our listeners to pause the podcast and go to Amazon.com and order your many many copies of The Gift of Being Different by Monica and Abigail Berg. Now, I was really distracted by your voice. <laughs> well, I wanted to share with why, why I know our listeners why are probably it sounds wondering, like you exactly. saw the frog. Exactly. So we've had uh, uh, many weeks of festivities and spiritual connections, and among some of them, there's a joyous, joyous dancing and singing. And I obviously sung and yelled a lot. So the voice is not a unhealthy uh, uh, um, uh, sore throat, but rather a very joyous uh, manifestation of joy. And that's why it sounds like this. But it sounds unhealthy. I still think you can sing and <laughs> sing loudly and learn how to use your voice properly. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, they can't be good for it. I actually, I actually have this thought. I mean, this is completely off topic, um, but actually, I often like have this incorrect. thought. I think that that just like with muscles, you want to push them, and then they get stronger. Uh, I could, by the way, probably an MD is probably listening to. Listen, this. I'll Let tell you know. right now, friend. No, it's just like no, moving you, muscles. You, know, you, don't, you, you use them too much. Oh yeah, I know a little bit about this. You can get a tear. Break, you yes. Can, well, but this isn't a tear. This can, is just a strain. No, and you can, you can, God forbid, a person can damage. Well, let's assume that I'm right. I think you're wrong. And if, it's, if, if, if there's a doctor that's listening, do you really want to be embarrassed? You're going to get so many. Letters. I don't mind being embarrassed. I love being. I'm, I'm curious about being embarrassed. Well, we are going to talk about curious, curiosity. Because... Yeah, so I love being curious about being embarrassed. Like new <laughs> ways of being embarrassed. I can provide some. <laughs> yes. Well, we are going to touch upon curiosity because we are picking up where we left off. We're talking about assumptions. We spoke about it a few weeks ago, but there is still more to say on this. And we are going to make it more specific in terms of assumptions and how they damage relationships. So I want to tell you stories and know how you like I this. I love the stories. It's about a boy from Calcutta, India who became a Nobel Prize winner by asking one simple question. How do you know that's true? His name is Abhijit Banerjee. He um, is a professor of economics at MIT. And again, he won the Nobel Prize in 2019 for his efforts to alleviate global poverty. And he says, or he said, I grew up in the middle-class family in the city of Calcutta. I just by accident, more or less, happened to live right next door to one of the biggest slums in Calcutta. So I had a slightly resentful childhood in the sense that I was surrounded by kids who didn't go to school, who were playing all day, whereas I had to go to the extremely boring school every day. Which I think it's interesting because already that's not where your mind would go when you're starting to hear the story. 
He said he didn't see the kids who lived in the slums as objects of pity or scorn. Kids in the slum were better at flying kites than Abhijit. In awe of how good the slum kids were at marbles, he was in awe of how good the slum kids were at marbles, even better than him at cricket. The slum kids assumed that he would be better because he came from middle class family. The slum kids, the slum kids were savvier than he was. They taught him how to curse, and he said he was coached by the experts. Those early relationships shaped the work that would lead to his Nobel Prize for his unique efforts to alleviate global poverty. As a kid, Abhijit was known for asking too many annoying questions. By the way, I love kids that ask lots of questions. I think we lose that novelty as we get older. For sure. Because we're afraid we'll look stupid. Yeah, my, I, 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 my, my favorite is when kids don't wait for the answer. It's a question after question after they're question. they're so curious. I, uh, During academia, he stopped questioning as many things. But he noticed that so much of our current understanding of economics was based on unproven theories that everyone took as facts. So he picked back up again, asking questions about the most fundamental foundations of economics and the reasons and solutions for poverty. Economics, this is what he said, economics is about questioning everything questioning assumptions you don't even know are assumptions, and being sophisticated about looking at data to uncover the facts. So that was a really cool way to look at this topic we're talking about today. Assumptions are our preferred stories. We're built to draw inferences, connect dots, and tell stories. And these stories we create help us make sense of the world and the people around us. Even if the story is wrong, we still feel comforted by it. And I know many people, right? A lot of the work that I do with people is about rewriting the story, changing the belief systems you have, because it doesn't matter if it's based on truth or not. If you believe it to be true, it is. Right. And I think what, what you're saying is that the stories that we have assumed are often a great barrier to relationships, certainly a great barrier for happiness. And and curiosity is what pierces through those assumptions. Really, being a person who lives as a curious being more often than an assuming being. It's interesting. I had a session with somebody earlier today, and I didn't even know that she wanted to talk about fear. And she um, and she and I think a lot of people struggle with this. Her whole thing was, you know, I want to know what my purpose is. She has a career that she likes that she enjoys, but she feels like her fear is she's afraid of dying and not having achieved something great and something purposeful, right? Because she has a family and she's married, has kids, has a career that's doing well, but she feels like she was meant to do something greater than what she's doing. So I talked about, you know, how much focus is on being versus doing in your day. And I said, you know, who do you want to be? And her answer, one of them was, I want to be happier. And I said, okay, what are the things that make you unhappy? So we went through that. And my advice to her is, why don't you start getting curious about who you could be, how you could change things in your life? And she's what do you mean be curious? I don't really understand. Like you had to see her face. She did not understand what it meant to be curious about self and about different ways we can react to different situations, just getting out of our own movie. We think we know ourselves. And I think that knowing is the same problem as assumptions, assumptions. and it stops us from changing. Whereas if you say no, I'm curious. I can I can react to the situation this way, or I'm curious at other. How, what are the other ways that I can react to it? And if you ask yourself those questions, first of all, you'll surprise yourself, which I think is fun. But also, you'll be on a path towards changing rather than being set in the ways that 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 you assume is who you are. But also, you know, I love to quote Bob the Builder. He doesn't say let's fix this. He says, how can we fix this? Just by asking yourself. The question, how can I be more curious? How can I do this differently? Your brain right away, the obedient servant it is, is like, oh, how, how? It starts to look for solutions. You know, it reminds me, like, even yesterday we were on a call and there was something that wasn't going right. And I was, it's, I'm always interested. Something inter- terribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm always interested on calls like that. There are people who are like, you know, ready to list all the problems and, and delve into them. And for me, it's always a simple question. Okay, so what's a possible what solution? We what's another? Well, we can't. We don't have a solution. What's another possible solution? You know, and ultimately, you'll almost always find that there is something that can be a solution rather than assuming, you know, these are the problems. It's very clear to us. This is the way things are. They can't be made better. You know, we'll have to wait. That's what I wanted to say. Somebody watched a video that I, something I said when we were in Israel, and um, we were at a different, at one of the uh, Kabbalists and, you know, sites, energy sites of where uh, he was buried. And um, anyway, in my talk, I was, referencing how, you know, I hope 
that um, that I feel humbled coming to such a great place with where I'm at. And her emailed me was like, "You're doing much better than you think you are." And I was like, "No, I think," and that's not what I'm saying, really, right? I think I'm being. I feel. I think that, that I'm being misunderstood. Like, thank you so much, but yeah, a- am I proud of of what I'm doing, the work I'm doing? Yes. Am I happy with? Uh, yes. I'm not beating myself up. I love myself, but if I put it in the context of who I desire to become, which I can't even see fully and I can't fully understand, but I know that there's more, right? It's just that knowing that allows you then to say, okay, I know that there's there's that and I can't see it. I'm curious about it. So every day I'm going to try to unpack that. And right. That's so things. important. Like, you know, like we've mentioned that over the past few weeks, we've gone through the Kabbalistic New Year. Um, and the message that I always share when I have the opportunity is that I have no idea what's coming in the next year, but I'm very excited to see it unfold. And I think that's a very different view, that that curious both view of life and desire in life, as opposed to many people who, again, want things to be sta- set and stable and want to everything to be, to be as it was. I want to know what this coming year is going to be. The reality is none of us can actually know, but more important than that, the great things, the exciting things are going to be the things that we have no idea about. So that curiosity about life, and even this day, you know, yes, we have some idea of what the plan for the day is going to be, but being really curious and excited about that curiosity, I think, is is, really, is what opens us up to greater possibilities than we're currently experiencing. So I think where people get stuck before they're like, oh yeah, curious, I don't know, future, I think we get stuck in our preferred stories, and they're usually negative, right? And I'm going to give you a few examples. Because we lean toward the explanation that reinforces our belief, for instance. And here's just a few. You don't get a promotion at work, so you assume you aren't good at your job. Your partner isn't very talkative of late, so you assume they are angry with you or losing interest in you. Your mother has never understood your choices, so you assume she doesn't really love you or not as much as your sister, let's say. So some of the most harmful assumptions we make are about our own value or odds of success. Assuming that someone will definitely turn you down before even trying, asking them, before even asking them out, right? Assuming that a client doesn't, let me say it again. Assuming that someone will definitely turn you down before you even ask them out on a date. Assuming that a client doesn't want to work with you before you even send an offer. Assuming that people are focused solely on one imperfection you have identified with your body, personality, work, or performance. Assuming that a group of people don't like you and they make fun of you. So we we already create this hole for ourselves based on just complete assumptions. Right. So one of the things that that um that I think is so important is when we talk about curiosity, I think it's important to underscore why it's so important. So there's a book, um, I don't know if you do you read the book Curious by Todd Cashton. You mean the book you borrowed from my desk? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't borrow it from your desk. Really, because I found it actually it on the bookshelf in your bookshelf yesterday. No, I, I, I was and, reading it on my iPad, so well, I don't think so. And I saw my notes all over. In fact, oh look, what's this? Oh yeah. I would say I really like the the thrust of the book. Uh, I don't know that I would recommend it as a great book, but but certainly the the. Uh, the basic thesis is very important. And I'll just share a few, a few uh, quotes from the book. By the way, uh, to all of our listeners, uh, I would recommend reading at least the first few chapters. I, th- I thought they were interesting. So he says, another reason that curiosity is neglected is that it operates below the surface of our desires. It's not as simple as thinking positive or being optimistic, being grateful, being kind, or feeling good. Being curious is about how we relate to our thoughts and feelings. It's not about whether we pay attention, but how we pay attention to what is happening in the present. And I think that's why curiosity is, like you said in your conversation today with with, uh, uh, somebody we're counseling, that we don't often understand what curiosity means, because you could be going through the same thing, but the question in your mind is, oh, that's interesting, rather than, oh, this is happening, or or why is this happening? Oh, that's interesting that it's happening. And I think curiosity is subtle, as taught as, 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 as the very famous psychologist is saying, because it has to, it's going through life and being curious rather than upset or disappointed or just experiencing. Well, I think the way I explained it to her, I think it's action oriented. 
when you're curious about something, it means that you're going to seek something out and try to see it a different way. Learn so you, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've added miles onto a run or even if, because I was curious about what was around the bend or what was up the hill or what was just in the far distance that looked something. Yeah, I don't think I've ever had, <laughs> that's <laughs> never happened to me, but okay. But even like, I, you know, I walk a lot. Actually, I will, I will share something, which is a little, I was actually, I was in a sauna and I was watching a game and I was curious to know what the end was going to be. So you so got I a few extra in minutes exactly. in there. Exactly. <laughs> or even in the city, you know, I get tired of walking the same streets, but I walk from, from the places I just, I love, I, not only just for the exercise, but I really love studying people and I love hearing little conversations that I'll pick up like a sentence here and there. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And then it gets me on a whole nother thought process or something I want to write about. But anyway, I usually, there's this one place where you, it looks like a dead end and you have to go up an avenue or down an avenue. And I always did it that way, the safe way. And one day I was like, no, I think I'll end up going through Grand Central Station, which would be really cool. I'm not going on the train. But you know what? I'm going to walk through. And it was so pretty and it was so fun. Now it's my favorite walk. But I, that curiosity has always served me for my greatest good. And and I think what you said is so important. You know, you often use the phrase, let's unpack it. I think curiosity is about knowing that every second in our lives has a limitless energy to it. And you can go past it or you can stop and unpack it. And whether it's actually a positive experience or a negative experience doesn't even matter. The joy of unpacking actually brings so much benefits to it. But I think it begins with the but thought. But I think you said it, you arrive at a knowing that you wouldn't have if you didn't exactly, exactly. explore it. Exactly. So, but I think, but I, I just want to underscore it because I think it's so important. We go through life fast, usually. And we certainly go through life fast when we're going through things we don't like and or things that aren't interesting to us in the moment. Converse, and I think what we're trying to inspire our listeners to, to come to, is to say every moment is full of great energy. And I don't want to go through anything fast. Not the good, not the bad, not the mundane. I want to unpack it. And that's what curiosity enables us to do. It enables us to unpack situations, learn from, experience different from, grow from. And I think it's so important. It really is so important. But by the way, everybody gets to that place in life. They don't, they don't always, they don't know it till they're there, uh, where they're like, you know, I'm, I'm just not, these things I've been doing for 10 years, it just doesn't make me happy anymore. And I, I just wish I wasn't here. I don't know why I'm in this place. And they're almost upset at themselves, like there's something wrong with themselves because they're not satisfied or content by what they were satisfied and content with all these years. And I'm like, this is great. This is awesome news because now you can become curious about yourself and who you're meant to become. But it's a, I, I do understand because I do, again, this is a conversation. I had this conversation with three different people today and I didn't know that that's where we were going to go, but that's where we ended up. And it wasn't even because this was on my mind. It's just that people get to that place in life where you can't always do things the way that you've done them. Because you should, you should we, never. But by our nature, we are right. hardwired for seeking, which is hand goes hand in hand with being curious. I, uh, not hand in hand. I think they're one and the same, yeah. right? They're one and the same. And unless, and this is what one of the one of the big uh, thoughts that that uh, that Professor Kasten uh, speaks about is the fact that unless you are living a curious life, you actually will never be happy. You can have moments of happiness, moments of success, moments of, of accomplishment, but living curiously is it actually allows the majority of your life to be fulfilling. Well, we know that firsthand. I, I think we moved to New York because we were curious about it. Right. I mean, right. we felt called, but we were really curious about it. What would life look like there? Right. And, that, that, and that's an important point as well, that curiosity leads you to the places that aren't, I don't want to use the word certain, secure, but are new and sometimes that scary. That are unknown. Unknown and sometimes scary. Unless you're living a curious life, you'll shy away from those places and often miss out on so many great experiences you could potentially have. So I'll just one more quote from, from, uh, from Curious. Um, Only in the present can we be liberated to do whatever it is we want. It's a razor thin moment when we are truly free. When we are curious, we exploit these moments by being there, sensitive to what is happening regardless of how it diverges from what it looked like before or what we expect it to be. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very important point because it's not about, oh, this is, this is an amazing thing just happened. Let me unpack it. That's also good. 
But how about, oh, this is not what I thought was going to happen. Let's unpack it. Oh, this is not what I wanted to happen. Let's unpack it. So I want to read these words again because I think they're both very inspiring and very uh, important for, for all of us to, to hopefully engage in a more curious life. So when we are curious, we exploit these moments. And that's what life is about, exploiting the moments, not letting them go by, by being there, sensitive to what is happening, regardless of how it diverges from what it looked like before or what we expect it to be. We are engaged and alive to what is occurring. We are energized. We are open and receptive to finding opportunities, making discoveries, and adding to the meaning in our life. To reiterate, it's not about being attentive. It's about the quality of our attention. I think this thought, if practically used, really transforms your life. Mm-hmm. And it's just a question of how, 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 how you make it as a, as a con- consistent and constant part of your life. I often look at small children, right? And I think that anytime I start to feel like a, a great quality, like being curious, kind of waning, I'm like, okay, what can I do more of that is similar to what children are doing? They're always looking for new things. They're always curious. They're always seeking. They want to have fun. They ask lots of questions. They appreciate the newness of everything, right? I think that you just need to go back to that to be guided. Yeah, and then maybe the final thing I'll share from from Curious, he, he, he the way he he posits it that the ideal person, he calls him, calls them, and hopefully us, the curious explorer. And I think if there's one thing that our listeners get from this podcast is how do each one of us become more of a curious explorer? What's interesting is I do want to say what I found from his book that I thought was really interesting. Um, He says, to discover the missing ingredient to a fulfilling life is that curiosity is nothing more than what we feel when we're struck by something novel. As we grow older, our instinct to explore is tempered by our desire to conform. Can say yeah. it better. Right. We stop asking questions because we might look stupid, right? We stop putting ourselves in positions where we're open to feedback, criticism, because we don't want to be vulnerable. We tend to dismiss curiosity as a childish, naive trait, but as Todd Cash didn't explain, it can actually give us profound advantages. So, I mean, I, I just want to underscore something you just said, which I think is so important. The reason we're so averse to criticism. Is because we're not curious. We don't want to be curious. We like, want to change. Yes, exactly. Whereas, and again, with all the caveats that, of course, some, not all criticism is good, and you shouldn't take it from everybody. But, 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 at, at, as as a basic point in life, you want to be somebody who actually does want to hear how you're perceived by other people. They could be right. They could be wrong. But isn't it interesting? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Yeah. No. So say. No, because when you're speaking, you know, I, I'm thinking about in, and this is why it's so tricky. If you're driving a car, right? There's certain things set up in place to make sure that you're a safe driver. Maybe you can improve. Maybe if you get too many tickets, it's an indication that you need to- Take a break. <laughs> or, or, or change the way you're driving, right? Or, I mean, with most physical things in life, there are things set up in this world to give you feedback, guidance, so you know, you know how you're operating. When it comes to things of character, of soul, of nature, right? One of those things, one of those tools is feedback. It might be some criticism. It, again, doesn't mean, again, with the speeding tickets, maybe the cop just likes to give tickets. I mean, of course, there's a balance. But I think if we could redefine these words that we really don't like, like vulnerability, feedback, criticism, um, input, however you want to phrase it, as your buffers, your guide to show you, like, how are you doing in this thing called life? I mean, that's really what that is. And I would add, it's not even so much what you're doing, it's just how you're being perceived, which is also important. So, so what comes to mind? Well, you have to unpack that because how you're being perceived, I'd really, well, so I think I'll, I think how people are experiencing give, you. I know you like me to give personal examples. So I'm going to- But did you hear what I said? No, How people again. are experiencing you. I don't think it's so much about how you're being perceived. I think that's tricky. Isn't that the same? No, how people are even perceived. Like, that's like what do they think of you. The experience is what are they? What are you putting out there? I, I would just not that it's Maybe important it's, to go into the, because well, I think how I think that yeah, it might be semantics, right? Because it might how you're up. how you're being experienced experience that word you said mm-hmm. is is how people are perceiving you, right? If you're being experienced as a nasty person, you're being perceived as a nasty person. I don't know that there's a difference. 
I used to like the word perceived. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep using it then. So, so I'll, use, I'll give you two examples, which I've, I, I, I make found. Make it good, Michael. Make well, it good and make it juicy. Um, I found them both illuminating and interesting. So, and because I, again, I, I do try and I do strongly believe in this idea. Did you get it criticized? Yeah, yeah. Oh, why it, didn't you tell me? <laughs> no, this is this has been over time. This oh, is this is. I thought it was like yesterday. Oh, it happens all the time. I get criticism all the time. Don't worry about it. Um, not least by you. No, you <laughs> no, don't. You know, we love true. you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Your family loves you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, so, so one, so two things that I that I've heard in the past about me and, and from people is first that I think this I forget who it's from exactly. I heard it from a few people that. People are um, what's the word? Not scared of me, but sort of um, yeah. That I that I might not be approachable, and to me that was so interesting because I see myself as the opposite of that. Like I'm, you sort of, I think I'm a relatively um, happy go lucky kind of person who's open to to people. But it, it made again, and this wasn't actually meant as a criticism when the person told me this. It's just that they sort of sort of see, saw me as you know this you know teacher and how, well, what, I think this example is more about. How they feel about exactly. themselves. Than no, but the point than, is, than, but but it made, did make me realize that that if I want to be more approachable, there's probably things, things that I can do. do. Right. Number one, number two, related to that was again, people thought that I was being uh, that I like I was being short, like being short with them. And why are you smiling? I don't know. <laughs> it might have been you. No, it wasn't me. That. I just. I mean, that's but the point. The point again, and again, I, I think you know. When I'm in certain certain situations or having certain conversations, you know, it's very bottom line, right? This isn't a, you know, especially like I would say in work situations where it's not to, to my mind a social situation where we be joking around. And, right when you say hi, good morning, how are you, and then you ask the question. <laughs> there you go. Oh, it was you. It, it, it's all coming back to me now. <laughs> well, anyway, but sometimes point, I'll see the text and I'll just, you know, little, yeah. hello, hello. So yes, but the point is, it was never. So when I heard that, it wasn't that I was like, oh. They're saying I'm a bad person, or to me it was always, oh, that's interesting, you know. And and if it's interesting enough, maybe there are ways for me to to mitigate that, to act in a different way. I think that's such an important point that that what happens in here, the ego is such a such an adversary. The ego is like, I don't want to hear anything wrong about you, me, right? The ego, I, I, I no criticism, you know, just keep 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 me as I am. Whereas the real, the soul's voice is, no, please let me hear. I'm so curious to change, to grow, to find out how I'm perceived, the good things, the bad things, everything. It's so important. So important. I agree. So what I would say, maybe when we talk about, as we relate specifically to relationships, the thought that I had is, as as many of our listeners know, we're very fond of John Gottman and... Um, and his uh, research into marriages. Mm -hmm. And he said, in his opinion, in his studies, and he's been doing this, I think, over 40 or 50 years now, mm -hmm. that there's three traits that are necessary for, for strong relationships. One is to be able to negotiate conflict. The second is to repair after uh, any type of uh, negative situation. And the third is curiosity. And of course, we're not going to talk the, the, about the first two, but the last one. That you know, when we talk about curiosity, everything we said until now, our, our listeners can say, "Well, you know, I might or might not be inspired or desiring to 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 be curious." I hope they are. But what I think John Gottman is telling us is that unless you are curious in your relationship, it is unlikely that you're going to have a strong and growing relationship. And I think. Um, one of the ways I think that it's important for our listeners to think about it is the idea of turning away and turning, and turning towards. towards, right? What does that mean? That when, again, in the words of John Gottman, when, when one of the partners, husband, wife, partner, is making a bid, it could be for attention, for attention or, or for, for anything, connection, for connection. There are in his research. There are those who turn towards, which means you know you say, "Oh, I saw something really strange today," and as opposed to saying, "Oh, say, oh, what was it?" Right. So that or right. saying, "Oh, you always see strange things." <laughs> <laughs> Enough of the strange things, right? So that's a bid, and you can turn towards it or turn away. In his research, I want to get these numbers right. Those whose relationship flourished, 
Seventy percent. Eighty-six percent turned toward tur- turned towards, and those who wound up being divorced. What do you think the percentage of turning away? Turning towards. Well, both. The uh, how much they turn towards each other? The ones that divorced. Yeah. Ten percent. Thirty-three percent. So which, which by the way, one would think that's not, skeptical. What? No, it's not. I mean, he has a ton of research on on why couples make it right. Out. But I think it's based, and this is one of the three pillars, right, of, of a strong relationship. And I think I, I was thinking, thinking about our relationship today. You know, eighty six percent means almost nine out of ten times that one partner makes a bid. We do. We try, but I'm saying, but my point is sometimes but, it's eight. Right, but my point, <laughs> my, my my point is thirty three percent doesn't sound that low, right? How many? Couples, do we know that are like down to zero or it 10? It sounds so low. Or you can imagine if, if one out of every three times, right? So you come home from work and you make. We're saying ten times. We're, we're, the research says that in order for the relationship to be strong, you have to be doing it eighty six percent of the percent of the time, right. which is about nine out of ten times, which means almost always almost perfect in in reciproc in turning towards a bid from your partner. That's not easy for busy, certainly for busy people. And on the other side of that, I was going to say, thirty-three percent is you know, if you're there or lower, which means that you. Wait, I just have to say yeah. something. It's not about it's is it easy or not with for busy people. It's about making the choice to do it or not. Because you know what, as busy as we all are, we can watch a game on TV or we can go. Like it's just about prioritizing. Right, but all this to bring back to the importance of curiosity in relationships. And I think what we're saying is, you know, I often I, I don't like to make things black and white. If you're not curious, you like to make things black and white. So, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Are you never, being curious? No, I've never heard you say that. Is that how you see yourself? I mean, let me think about this for a second. Yeah. I never thought of how you in I that perceived? way. I guess I, you know, it when is I'm true teaching, about I'm, you, I'm but but you're so not that way in a relationship. You're so oh, not. No. You're so gray. Well, not about you your gray. like you My allow a lot of. Um, Leeway. You do. Yeah, yeah. No, not harsh. But wait, if I'm if I'm give, giving over a point or if I'm teaching. No, I guess your opinions uh, are black and white, but your delivery. No, your ability to see the other's point of view and yeah, meet yeah, of them. course. That's not. Yeah, absolutely. That's just interesting because yeah. usually people are black and white. They're black and white I everywhere. Still curious. Yeah. Huh. Huh. I never thought about that. So <laughs> my point was. <laughs> what was it? That that if you're in a relationship. Unless you're actively curious, and we're using the example here of bids and turning towards, but that's just one example. Unless you're curious about what is happening with your partner, what they feel, what they say, and you're actually not just curious, but you're asking about it and delving more deeply into it, the chances of your relationship surviving, forget about being great, is close to zero. Well, I've written about this in Rethink Love, this exact point, and I quoted John Gottman. The example I gave from our lives is that if you were watching something that was funny um, and you'd call me over and say, Monica, look at this, I think you'd really enjoy it, I, nine times out of 10, come. Even if my hands are full of cookie dough or I'm in the kitchen or I'm like, it's not the opportune time, I will because, and that was a decision I made early on, and you'd do the same for me. That if you took the time to stop watching what you're watching, as for that example, because and you stopped, you could have continued enjoying yourself because you wanted to share it with me because you thought I would enjoy it. That warms my heart, and I want to reciprocate. And I'm and I don't take that for granted that you cared enough to stop what you're doing to show me to share a moment with me and to connect. And I think that is why that is the glue or one of the three pillars that he talks about because it creates a connection and appreciation. It's not just about. Oh yeah, okay. Um, I'll turn towards. No, it's so much deeper than that. Absolutely, and I, it's interesting to point out that out of the three pillars, it's the only positive one, right? The other two are conflict resolution and repair. Right. This, this is what I'm saying. This brings this, you. This is maybe again to my mind, if not the most important, amongst the most important. And I think often in relationships, people say, "Well, you know, we have the same goals. We have a family. We want we want the same things in life. You know, we have we have fun together." Whatever, whatever, there's a list of things that people. Have in their mind, if not if not clearly concrete in 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 their in their mind of what's going to make the relationship work. Well, good or bad news is that actually what's going to make your relationship work is constant curiosity. Nine times out of ten, at least, be curious about whatever your partner is saying, 
doing, like you said, it might not just be words, it could be a sigh, it could be, you know, anything. And unless, and again, good news, bad news, if, unless you're doing that nine times out of ten, unless curiosity is a consistent uh, part of your relationship, unlikely that the relationship will grow. And as the research shows, more likely that it will it will wind up either in divorce or just not being a great relationship. And I often use this example uh, how people are with their children or even with their pets. They're very curious about everything. Oh, they did that. That's new. They did. Oh, they did this other thing. I hadn't seen that before. That's a different behavior. And mostly it's because I think um, if it's a child, you know, we feel kind of ownership or responsibility there. If it's a pet, they can't speak for themselves. We're paying a lot of attention because for many reasons, we don't do that with our partners. We don't do that in relationships right. per se. But if you approach your relationship the way you approach those other two examples I just gave, imagine how different your relationship would be. And I, another, um, point that I wanted to bring up is we often jump to conclusions a lot. You know, we, we assume that um, my partner likes this restaurant or they like Italian, so they'll want to go to this restaurant tonight without ever asking them, without giving them the option of like, you know, do I still know this by my partner? Has it changed? Or do I just, I'm assuming it because it's always been this way. And even if you've been married 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, I think that we assume that we know them and we don't give the the space to say, wait a second, we've been married this long. I know I've changed from who I was or what I desired five years ago. And my partner has too. So it's so important to be able to constantly, and again, that's the curiosity, but just because it's been a certain way for a certain period of time doesn't mean that it's still that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And unless you're curious, and I, the point is, even if it hasn't changed, the fact that you asked the question is already being curious and already improving the relationship. So it's not so much that every time you ask a question, the answer is going to be something that surprises you. The fact that you're actually interested what the answer is going to be is creating that clue and the growth in the relationship. Yeah, it's like it shows you really care. Yeah. You're you're interested enough to say, you know, what is it that you want to do or what what's on your bucket list? What has changed, you know, we whenever I recognize something new about myself, you're the first person I tell. And because you're my best friend, but also you know, we need to make sure we know what's going on in each other. Like seriously, what's going on in our worlds and what excites us still. I do want to give one tip that really worked for me in stopping um in stopping making and transcending assumptions and not making them anymore. I remember one summer I had this epiphany that I don't need to ever assume anything about a person's motivation or actions of why they've done something. I have no idea what's going on in anybody's mind. I stay really current what's going on in my own mind, <laughs> very available to myself. But I realize like I have no idea. And even if I was really close to somebody or even if I was really not close to somebody, I'm aware that all of that can change. And so if I ever felt something that was different or there was a weird energy or juju going on, I made it a practice and I've continued since I had that epiphany saying I'd call the person up and I guess for some who really don't like confrontation, which I don't think it has to be, it's really conversation. Yeah, but you love those. And I have clarity. And I and also I don't have enough time or patience or desire to entertain a story that may or may not be true. It's just a waste of time in my book. And I don't want to do it anymore. It's boring and it was taking too much out of me. So I decided that there's nothing I'm afraid, but this is the thing. Here's the caveat. I decided there's nothing I'm afraid of hearing. I can, I was secure enough to say, okay, I can take it or leave it. I can decipher what is true for me and what is more about them. And so when I finally got to that place and I had the courage to to be in this space. And so I would go to the person, I would either text them or call them and say, hey, you know, I'm feeling something. Is there something you want to tell me? Or, you know, I is maybe there was a misunderstanding or I'm just really curious. And every single time they would let down their armor and they would say how they felt because really people at the end of the day do want to be heard. And they they don't always have the the courage or also the confidence or even the clarity to be able to do that. So I think that's a game changer. Like if you want one tip on how to really get on the other side of this, just don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to ask anything. Nice. Nice. So is it nice? <laughs> it's curiously nice. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so a quote that I really like from Albert Einstein about curiosity. My God, how do you have all my? Have you been reading my books? How did you know? I have that here too. So go for it. You, no, would, let me see if it's the same one. I don't want to waste time. Me. Wait, wait, no, tell wait. me the quote. Tell me your quote. I have no special talent. Oh no! What is I'm that? only passionately curious. Interesting. Yes. 
That wasn't nice. the one I was thinking about. Nice. Most people stop looking when they find the proverbial needle in the haystack. I would continue looking to see if there were other needles. I like that one better, but they're both by him. So yes. they're both good. <laughs> Curiously good. So Curiously delicious. This should be like a great coupon commercial. Curiously tasty. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm hungry. I'm going to uh, start making food uh, references. Uh, yes, yeah, and, It's nearly dinner time. Yes. What are we going to have? I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious too. I have no idea. Me either. <laughs> Who's cooking? <laughs> so uh, I'd like to share a really beautiful email that we got from one of our listeners. And uh, again, reminding all of our listeners to please make sure to send your questions, comments, stories, inspirations to Monica and Michael at Kabbalah.com. We read them, we are inspired by them, and often we get to read them to the rest of our listeners, and it inspires them as well. I do want to say one other thing that came to my mind, and, um, and it's a compliment to you. So, in this book launch, uh, which is my least favorite part of writing and publishing a book, is this part of it where, you know, you need to ask people, like, would you like to read my book, please, and come to this and that. It's just not my comfort zone there. But, um, and I, I'll do all of it. And then, you know, it's hard not to get disappointed if there's an issue on shipping or whatever the, the details that come up. And I never assume, and I never put it on you that, you know, you need to help me or this is not working. And last night there was an issue around this and like you just stepped in and went above and beyond. Aww. No, but the thing is, I never assume and I never expect that from you. I mean, I suppose if you didn't do it, I would be disappointed, but it's not even <laughs> like, do you understand what I'm saying? It's not even in our relationship, which I think is, is a really important point for our listeners, no expectation, no assumptions, assumptions, be clear about what's important to you. And if the person's, again, curious and paying attention, they're going to step up and show up. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, the letter? Yes. Dear Monica and Michael, in parentheses, m and I've been writing this in my mind for several weeks now. And so I've finally taken a few minutes to actually finish what I've been imagining. First, I need to extend my deep gratitude for your for you both and your podcast. I contracted the Delta variant of COVID about a year ago, and it somehow significantly altered my brain. I've been dealing with overwhelming anxiety and intense depression ep depressive episodes since that time. I've been residing in a very dark place with a constant cascade of the darkest thoughts for days and months unending. This summer, I've been working in a very isolated job which hasn't helped, and only my headphones as company. Silence wasn't an option, nor music, as my mind would drift into horribly anxious places. A friend suggested podcasts, and after a couple of unsatisfying attempts, the universe led me to spiritually hungry. In parentheses, as Michael often says, there are no coincidences. I've truly enjoyed getting to know both of you, as well as stories about your four children and your puppy, Miles. <laughs> I've been able to listen to about six to eight episodes each day. That's wild. In parentheses, I work for 12 hours a day. And so I've gone through the first 110, and I'm halfway through the series for a second time wow. now. I've benefited tremendously from your sharing. I appreciate the spiritual concepts, as well as the anecdotes, stories, and scientific research that provide support for the topics you share. I'm not sure where I would be today if I hadn't been led to your benevolent messages, but that seems irrelevant now. It came to me when I truly needed it. You have educated, motivated, challenged, and inspired me. You have caused me to laugh, cry, and most importantly, to start to repair the destructive trajectory that I was spiraling into. You helped save me. Probably the most profound lesson you've passed to me is through the, synerg th th through the synergistic manner in which you both interact and both support and complement each other. I grew up with horrible relationship role models and failed into marriages and numerous other romantic relationships, and I'd become quite cynical. You've both shown me a working model of compassionate and successful companionship. It's so uplifting. I'm still near the bottom of the hole, but I'm starting to recognize that the way out is up instead of continuing to burrow deeper and dig my own grave. With the armor and tools that you provided, I'm optimistic that I can find my way back safely. 
I hear your requests at the end of each episode to write or share. I've certainly shared many of the episodes with my five adult children, and now I'm writing to thank you both. I hope you enjoyed reading this as much as I've enjoyed writing it. <laughs> Sincerely grateful, spiritually starving, Dale. Love. That is so beautiful. Very nice writing. By yes. Way. By the way, I did enjoy it. I think I enjoyed reading it more than you enjoyed writing it. And I find this personally very, I'm sure Monica very as well, very inspirational. I hope our listeners find this very inspirational. Um, and so therefore, thank you, Dale. And thank you to all of our listeners. But please make sure to keep now sharing. Now I feel such pressure. We got to get some more episodes out for our... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Please make sure to share this podcast with as many people as you can. On Apple Podcasts, write five-star reviews. Send your questions, common stories, inspiring stories to Monica and Michael at Kabbalah.com. And these, these emails truly are greatly, greatly inspiring. Thank you so much for being open and vulnerable and, and, and sincere with us. It really, really inspires us. Stay spiritually hungry.